the National Spine Health Foundation, we are the only patient-centered medical nonprofit focused on spinal health care. Our mission is to empower patients with knowledge and hope through programs like this. We conduct important research that proves which treatments work. Today, we are going to hear from leading experts from around the country, surgeons, doctors, providers, who are joining us on our mission to educate America about what the best treatments might be for them to overcome their neck and back pain. We cannot do our work alone. We rely on the generosity of so many because we are a foundation. During this program, if you feel compelled, we invite you to consider making a donation by clicking on the button on our webpage. No gift is too small, and every little bit helps. I'd also like to acknowledge our sponsor for today, our corporate sponsor, Medtronic, whose generosity helped make this program possible. So it is now my honor to introduce my surgeon, my friend, and the president of the board of the National Spine Health Foundation, Dr. Tom Schuler. Thank you, Rita. We are so excited to welcome our audience here locally, but also across the nation today. This is truly a landmark day where we are reaching out to help the nation, help people understand that they can overcome their neck and back problems. Spinal health care has changed so much over the past several decades that it's a new area. We can help people get their lives back. Which brings us to the purpose of the Spine Health Foundation, which is to empower patients, empower you with knowledge and with hope. For the power of hope comes from knowledge. And that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna translate the foreign language of medicine into people speak, into words that you can understand so that you can know the best options for you, understand what works, and find ways to overcome. Most people come into our office, they're afraid. They don't know that there's a hope. They're worried that they have cancer. They're worried that their problem is ending their life. What we're able to do is through the miracles of modern spinal surgery and modern spinal health care, help them understand that they can overcome their disability. They can overcome their pain and suffering and then get their lives back. By understanding that there's hope and then working with experts who can help them solve their problem, they get back to their families, they get back to their community, to their jobs. And that is what brings us great warmth. We are so excited to be here to share this online today, but we will continue this forward so that people have this as a resource. There's a true crisis in healthcare today. Physicians are being pressed to move faster and faster with patients. And many really don't understand how to speak in people terms. What we here at the foundation are going to do is to give you a resource, a neutral site that you can come to and understand the best options available, what your diagnosis is, what treatments are available, and what treatments work. Through our research and through our connections with the leading experts across the country, we will help educate you and empower you so that you know how to overcome your problems. We are going to talk about many different topics, and as time goes on, we will answer different ones as you contact us, as you send us information and questions, not just today, but moving forward, so that we can help solve your problems, we can help you overcome, we can help tell you about the beauties of modern medicine and modern spinal health care. Because this isn't your grandmother's spinal health care. It's what we have today we can solve and put people back on the playing field to their jobs and to their lives. With that, I'd like to welcome all of you. We're gonna start with our first video from Dr. Steve Glassman from the Leatherman Spine Institute. And he is going to educate us about the importance of knowledge, knowledge of your problem and how we solve these issues. To the video. One of the really big changes in the way that we look at spine care and spine surgery uh, over the past 20 years um, is the, the use of what's called uh, patient-based outcome measures. So historically, whether a patient did well with surgery was determined by the doctor said you did well or the doctor said you didn't do well, um, which obviously is not necessarily the best way to look at it. And in medicine in general, in orthopedics in general, but particularly in spine, um, 
uh, we've really moved to using uh, the patient's own reports of their improvement in function uh, and improvement in quality of life as um, the primary metric of the success of an intervention. And while this is true across a lot of orthopedics, it's been, spine has really been the leader in, in utilizing that um, concentration on the patient in terms of trying to judge the value of, uh, of different interventions. Um, and actually, um, that started uh, uh, probably in the early uh, 2000s. And one of the first uh, important interactions was a collaboration with Leatherman Spine Center and uh, VSI, um, which uh, looked at um, thresholds for patient, for patient uh, outcome measures. So um, you fill out a survey and it gives you a number, but that number doesn't really reflect an, uh, an inherent value when someone says, uh, you have an ODI score, an Oswestry Disability Score of 30. Is that good? Is that bad? If you go up 10, is that good or that bad? It's, it's hard to really understand. It's not like uh, looking at a Tiffany necklace or saying something's 14 karat gold where you inherently understand what that means. Um, so, so the way people get around that is by developing thresholds that represent um, the amount of change that firstly patients can recognize as a real change consistently, and then more importantly, looking at the amount of change that patients identify as, as a major improvement in their, in their symptoms. And um, those patient metrics, those patient reported outcomes have become the currency for how we determine the value of any intervention of therapy, of injections, of surgery. Um, it's also the tool by which um, people try to judge economic value. Is a treatment cost effective? The Leatherman Spine Center has been really integral to coming to understand patient-based outcome measures and how that can be, be applied. There are elements of that that we've done really well. I think that looking at what's important to the patient is, is really improve the quality of care that we deliver. Um, but there are elements that really still need work. Um, one of the things that I think is really important is patient expectations. So it turns out what the patient anticipates, what they expect to be better after an intervention, really has a significant bearing on how they do, how they regard the treatment that they've received. And that's something that uh, uh, we're trying to study and trying to develop metrics uh, to assess uh, patient expectations uh, um, uh, at, at the moment, that's a, a focus of, of, of some of the research we're doing. Um, another really important thing is the issue of health literacy. So across a lot of chronic diseases, if you look in diabetes, if you look in cardiac disease, um, it's been well demonstrated that a patient's understanding of what their doctor says to them, of the medical language, impacts their response to treatment and the effectiveness of treatment. Uh, doctors tend to use big terms um, as if the patient's simply going to understand that. And a lot of patients will, you know, nod and you'll get the impression they understand when in fact that may not be the case. Um, that leads to people taking the wrong medication, the wrong dose, the wrong timing, um, repetitive treatments. And People have addressed that um, with techniques like teach back, where you get the patient to repeat back to you um, what you've tried to explain to them. And while that's been very effective across a range of specialties, um, that's something that's not really been done at all in spine surgery. Dr. Steve Glassman just really showed us the importance of knowledge. And, and what we know is that if people don't understand what their problem is, what's expected, how to recover, it impacts the end result. And after all, what we as physicians, what we as healthcare providers are here to do is to get people back to their lives, not just treat a certain problem. And so educating them as to the solutions, but also the entire pathway that they need to go to for full functional recovery is so critical. And that's what we're gonna to try to do is share that knowledge and help people understand. 
So our next panel is going to be led by uh, Sabrina Woodleaf, our Community Relations Director. Thank you, Dr. Schuller. Hello and welcome. I have the distinct honor to introduce you to two of the nation's top spinal specialists who often collaborate together in leading and pioneering the most advanced non-operative and operative treatments. So please help me welcome Dr. Colin Haynes, a spine surgeon and director of research, as well as Dr. Natish Barrara, a non-operative specialist and dir director of regenerative medicine, both at the Virginia Spine Institute. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. I'd like to start with Dr. Haynes. As a spine surgeon, do you always recommend surgery? I certainly do not. So it's rare, if ever, that I meet someone for the first time and recommend surgery. And this is for two major reasons. First off, nine out of 10 patients with spinal problems get better without needing surgery. Now there's a variety of treatments that can, be, that can get patients back to their functionality and get them pain free, spanning the gamut from physical therapy to medications, sometimes needing injections, sometimes regenerative medicine, and occasionally surgery is needed, but the vast majority of the times, patients are able to get back to 100% enjoying everything they want to do in life without needing surgery. Another major reason that I don't recommend, in general recommend surgery the first time I meet someone, is simply because the spine has a lot of thinking that goes along with it. It's rare, if ever, that I see someone for the first time and know everything that's going on with their spine without needing to do another test, trying an injection or trying some of the physical therapy that would give me enough knowledge to know exactly how to surgically treat their spine. Thank you. That's very powerful and intriguing to hear coming from a spine surgeon. Uh, Dr. Barrara, you've recently been named the face of regenerative medicine by Washingtonian Magazine. What are some common myths and understandings you can share with the audience around what regenerative medicine is for the spine? Sure. <clears throat> So non-operative care in the spine is really a spectrum of care. So it starts with both, like starts with physical therapy and can progress all the way to surgery. And so if you do physical therapy and you may not improve with physical therapy, there are other treatments like traditional non-operative care, like steroid injections and that sort of thing. And sometimes that's what you need to get better and treat the symptoms. And then you have regenerative medicine, which kind of bridges the gap between traditional non-operative care and spine surgery. And so the term regenerative medicine is used a lot. And most people don't understand what really what regenerative medicine is. And it's pretty simple. It's really just the science of healing a damaged tissue naturally. So you're replacing damaged tissue with, with something that's, uh, that's well healed and that's functional. And so Regenerative medicine is a very important part of the non-operative uh, side of treatments. And in the spine, we see non-operative uh, non -operative care um, as a, a palliative method because traditional non-operative care with steroid injections really treat inflammation. With regenerative medicine and trying to heal the problem, we, we use different treatments like stem cell injections, which allow you to place stem cells in an area and allow them to differentiate or turn into the type of cells you want to create. Or we use platelet-rich plasma or PRP. These are treatments that uh, many of you have heard of. And these are um, placing growth factors and, and, and enhancing the environment um, and, uh, to, to actually reheal. And then there's other treatments like prolotherapy, which also stimulates the healing process. And so, depending on the pathology that you have, depending on the disease state that you have, I think it's very important that we consider regenerative medicine options. And one of the main issues that we see in, in, in spine-related uh, disease is degenerative disc disease. And one of the main problems that we're, we have is that we're unable to treat degenerative disc disease very well, non-operatively. And one of the things that we have seen is the use of regenerative medicine in the disc has allowed us to one stop disc related pain and improve the stability of the spine by treating the disc. Thank you. For 
As a spine surgeon and a non-operative specialist, can you both speak on any case examples that maybe have worked with regenerative therapies or some that perhaps have not? Sure, so this is a, a very uh, broad and a very appropriate question for this, this uh, panel, simply because once upon a time, if you had a de painful degenerative disc, painful arthritis in the back, the only option was either you live with it or you get surgery. Well, regenerative medicine is this huge area that bridges that gap, as Dr. Barrar was telling us about. So we get this question day in and day out. When would a regenerative medicine option be a more appropriate treatment for me, or when would a surgery be a more appropriate treatment for, you, for me? In general, if we've gotten to the point where all our routine non-operative treatments have not worked and the patient still has debilitating back pain that's not responding, surgery is oftentimes suggested in situations where the spine has poor alignment. So some of the things that we hear about scoliosis or when the spine has an S-shaped curve to it or a term called spondylolisthesis, which is just a big fancy term for meaning the discs themselves are moving around more than they should. When the spine is moving more than it should in whatever manner, in general, in general terms, we're typically recommending surgery. However, if the spine's structure is good, if it's not moving abnormally, if it's overall a degenerative disc but not a tremendous amount of arthritis causing the spine to move poorly, that's a huge opportunity to try regenerative medicine treatment options as opposed to needing surgery. We're seeing amazing results in these patients. Thank you, Dr. Barra. Yeah, and one of the things that Dr. Haynes mentioned was a degenerative disc. And the disc is the shock absorber of the spine. And as you age, what happens is you lose the hydration or the water that's within the disc, and the disc gets stiff. And when the disc gets stiff, it starts getting more and more degenerative, and that time, at times, that can cause pain. Or you could have a traumatic event where you tear your disc and that causes pain as well. And what we've seen at the Virginia Spine Institute, we've done hundreds of injections into the disc with regenerative medicine options and it's been, we've had fantastic results with treating that population. So we found that population to be a very, very that population to be, to be able to respond very well to regenerative medicine techniques. But just like Dr. Haynes mentioned, there are plenty of, of, of different issues that don't lend well to regenerative medicine as well. And Dr. Haynes mentioned uh, more severe cases of something called spondylolisthesis, where we see large move, some potentially large movements of the spine, and the spine being really unstable. And in that situation, surgery may be the best option. But we have found many different problems and issues in the spine respond very well to different regenerative medicine techniques. I think it's important to highlight that not all people with painful discs end up needing either surgery or regenerative medicine treatment options. And I'm an example of that. When I was in high school, I was playing soccer, I slipped and fell and I herniated a disc and I had terrible back pain and leg pain. Well, my back pain and leg pain is completely gone now and it's simply because I was able to do physical therapy, take pills, over-the-counter medications, and with just a little bit of time and keeping my, my core strong, I have no, no longer have any pain whatsoever. So it's a rare subset that people end up needing these sorts of treatments, but when people get to the point that all normal non-opera treatments aren't working, these are two potential very, uh, two very attractive potential treatment options. For those patients who are in that scenario, what type of questions should they be asking their providers to see if regenerative therapies would be the right solution? What type of tests should they be aware of? Can you speak on that? Um, sure, so uh, I think one of the biggest things which we've touched on is w in order to know if these treatments are needed, we have to make sure we've done all the other routine non-operative treatments. Sometimes modifying physical therapy, sometimes trying certain injections is really all that's needed in order to get patients back to 100% pain-free lifestyle. Now, if there is progressive nerve damage or severe instability, as we talked about, where the bones are moving around where they shouldn't, but if someone's having worsening leg pain, worsening sciatica, and we do diagnostic tests that tell us that the nerves are actually worsening as we're watching them, typically those are scenarios where we're recommending doing a surgery because that takes the pressure off the nerves and stabilizes things to make it a much safer environment for the nerve. And I, I agree with all that, and I think it's, it's very important that we're able to find the pain generator. We do not want to treat an MRI, and it's very, very common what you, what you see is a, you look at an MRI and you see a, a disc bulge and you think that's where the problem is coming from. And what we use non-operative, many of the non-operative treatments is to, to make a diagnosis. 
And because when we make a diagnosis, we're able to provide a good treatment option. And that may be a regenerative medicine, or it may be physical therapy, or it may be a surgical sur surgery. But the most important thing that you do is you truly make a diagnosis and you find where that pain is coming from. Because that, is, that always isn't as easy as just looking at an MRI. You know, that may involve doing a nerve test or that may involve checking the disc integrity. So there's lots of different options that we use to help make that diagnosis. And depending on, depending on what the diagnosis is, there's a wide variety of treatments. And regenerative medicine may be one of those options. Thank you very much. Dr. Barr, can you speak to any of the innovations in regenerative medicines that are making it easier for patients to perhaps have access or be knowledge, uh, excuse me, knowledgeable and, and feel empowered to make that decision? So I, I think it's, <clears throat> regenerative medicine is a newer field and it's a newer science. And we continue to innovate in the field of regenerative medicine. We've started, we initially were doing a lot of platelet-rich plasma, or PRP, which is growth factor injections, and that has gotten very popular because a lot of athletes have gotten it. We have moved into the realm of doing stem cell-based injections from bone marrow, and, and I think as we continue to do more of these regenerative medicine procedures, we're getting a better idea of what works and what doesn't work, and what disease, what problems really do lend well to regenerative medicine, and what and what don't, and and potentially it are severe cases, uh, there's severe cases not do well with regenerative medicine. We don't always see that. Some very severe cases do very well with regenerative medicine. So I don't, you know, with with the with the innovation in regenerative medicine, we're learning more about who is a good candidate. That is a great segue into my next question. Who is a good candidate, Dr. Haynes, when you're looking at your patients and deciding if that is a, a treatment option that you would like to provide to them, what type of things do you consider and what can patients uh, identify with that they might be a candidate for regenerative therapies? Sure. So um, kind of pointing on the point-counterpoint between surgery and regenerative medicine, when if it's patients have gotten to that point where we're talking about one option versus the other. The two major things that I look at are number one is instability, and number two is if there's worsening nerve damage. So by instability, again, I mean scoliosis, meaning a curvature of the spine, or, or basically when the bones aren't placed in the body's normal position. When the bones are moving around abnormally, oftentimes stabilization, getting the bones to move together with surgery itself, is a better option. Also, if patients are having worsening nerve damage and the nerves themselves, by, by having prolonged pressure on them, are worsening with time and becoming more unhealthy, those are the two major scenarios where I typically recommend surgery over regenerative medicine. Does, do basic demographics like age or gender affect anything? So initially, um, we were thinking that as patients aged, as they got older, that they'd have less viable stem cells, less viable growth factors in their body. So initially, the um, patients we were selecting were in general younger and healthier. Well, as those patients started doing tremendously well, we gradually started opening up our indications, saying, well, try a patient who's a little bit older who theoretically may not have as many stem cells in their body. Well, then we saw those patients who were doing well. So we went a little bit older, and we saw that those patients were doing well. So currently, for myself, Age doesn't play a factor in terms of recommending regenerative medicine or recommending for or against it. Similarly, gender, I haven't seen any differences between men and women, so age and gender are not big factors for me at this point. Thank you. In closing, I'd just like to ask Dr. Barrar, is there any one main important thing that you'd like to say to the audience today about regenerative medicine? Well, I, I think <clears throat> one of the things we need to realize in spinal health care is it's not just about regenerative medicine or spine surgery. It's really a, a large spectrum of treatments. And we don't just use non-operative care or just regenerative medicine or just spine surgery. Many of the times we use these in combination with each other. So it's very important that you discuss all the potential treatment options with your, with your physician and to really understand where the problem is coming from so you can know what the potential treatment options are. Thank you very much. Thank you, panelists. Dr. Schuler. Well, that's exciting. I mean, re regenerative medicine really is going to transform spinal health care. 
In fact, I know I'm, I've had regenerative medicine. I had four of my discs injected because I was having intractable back pain, couldn't function. And through the use of bone marrow aspirate from my own bone marrow, my own pelvis, we were able to get this problem solved. And actually, I'm back golfing and enjoying life and being a spinal surgeon. And, and that wouldn't have been possible without regenerative medicine before we had it. It's also important to understand in this term osteobiologics, which is using the products of our body to help heal, um, which is part of uh, regenerative medicine, that this is something that is used best if we use our own material. So taking it from uh, a cadaver, taking it from somebody else, taking it from a uh, placenta, and, and having it freeze-dried or processed is not as effective as using our own. And the way I summarize it is a little bit like Fix-A-Flat or Flex Seal that we're taking this product and we're sealing the tears in the disc. We don't actually make the disc normal. We're not making it a 50-year-old a disc, a 20-year-old disc. What we're doing is repairing the tears so that people can function normally. And using the powerful biology that we have within us, we're able to achieve that success, and remarkably. In fact, I'm living proof. I am a spinal champion, and, and Dr. Roy introduced that earlier, saying that a spinal champion is somebody who has overcome neck or back problems through proper tri uh, spinal treatment, whether it's rehab or surgery. And actually, I'm a, I'm a multiple spinal champion. I've got artificial discs in my neck and infusion in my neck. I've had laminectomy, I've had regenerative medicine. And, and I'm living proof that we can get back to full and active lives. The next video that we're going to present is really talking about some of the great advances in, in spinal surgery. And this is saying, what approach, what surgical approach, how do you get to the spine? In to, uh, to achieve a successful fusion if a fusion is necessary. And like Dr. Haynes said, we, we, we don't operate on everybody. In fact, only about 10% of people need to go to surgery. Most can be healed non-operatively. But for those 10% that need surgery in the lumbar spine, our next video is going to discuss some of the options available today. Many people say, well, I need to have my spine fused. How should it be done? And, and the answer is really depends on what your problem is, what the pathology is. That will dictate what the best approach is for a talented spinal surgeon to choose. No two patients are the same, no two operations are the same, no two pathologies are the same, and so we need to have a wide variety of options so we can best treat each situation. What we're going to talk about today is the anatomy of the spine. In the lumbar spine, we can see there are vertebral bodies with discs in between them. And this is what allows the spine to move by having a disc. It's like a flexible ligament that allows you to bend and move but it also involves having two joints in the back. These are called the facet joints. And these facet joints with the disc form a three-legged stool at each level where you have one vertebra above, one vertebra below, then the disc and the two joints in the back which allow for dynamic motion. Well, sometimes that disc gets injured or the facet gets injured or nerves getting pinched because of, of arthritis or a herniation. And we need to stabilize that segment to stop that abnormal motion which is causing crippling pain and help the patient overcome. And in fact, in those cases, a spinal fusion is very successful in helping people get their lives back. So what we're gonna talk about are the different approaches we can do. And traditionally, spines were fused from behind, and nowadays, more often, they're fused from the front by cleaning out the disc and putting a cage or device in that space. But there's actually three easy ways for us to approach the spine. From the back, from the side, and from the front and we would use the different ones in different situations. But let me explain the traditional fusion. Again, the fusion is bonding one vertebra to the next, and in the back, traditionally it was done by laying bone across these structures back here. This is a lamina and spinous process, and bone would be laid across that to try to bond it together. Then later, it was tried to put it across what we call these transverse processes, these little knobs sticking out the side of the bone. Laying bone across there would lead to a fusion. The problem is these areas don't have a lot of surface area, so they have less ability to, to, to get a fusion, a successful fusion, to actually bond those bones, which is why older surgeries had poor success rates. With the understanding of the disc space or the inner body space between the vertebral bodies, we have a much more rich area for a fusion to occur. And why is that? It's because it's a bigger surface area. If we actually take a look at a model, we can see you have this entire surface area for the fusion as opposed to just a little bit of bone here or here. This area is well vascularized, so it's got blood supply and oxygen's important for the bones to heal. And then it's also under compression, and compression stimulates the bone cells to grow and to heal. 
So this is a much better place for us to achieve a fusion if our goal is to actually fuse one bone to the next. And so when we're doing that, we then have to decide, are we gonna do this from behind, from the side or from the front? And the physicians that are doing this nowadays need to be trained in all these techniques so that they can pick what is right for that specific patient. No two patients are the same, no two problems are the same, no two solutions are the same. And so we have to identify the best way to solve each person's problem, which means we have to be facile with all these approaches as a modern spinal surgeon in order to give the patients the best treatment, the best options. If we look at a model, this would be an example of cages that were put into the disc space from the front. So that would be right here. And you can see these are large cases that allow us to realign the spine and fill that entire area with the supportive structure, which then the bone can grow all the way through. We also use screws and rods, where in this case, these would be put in from behind, and these screws and rods go into the bone and give us great fixation of the spine. And this acts much like a cast that you put on your arm if you break your arm to help the bones heal, you wear the cast. That's what this does. This is an internal cast, which we put into the spine. And that actually holds the bones together while they heal. Once they heal, this could potentially come out, but doesn't have to. And that's something that we often do if people have symptoms around them, but they can also be left in for, for the patient's lifetime. Those cages in the front usually stay in permanently. Well, hopefully that was clear, so I, I won't expand too much on it. But the important thing to know is that there are many options available and that true spinal surgeons today are well-versed in all approaches and will pick which approach is best for the individual patient, their anatomy, their problem. And, and, and that's the important thing to understand is as you're choosing your spinal specialist out there, and a spinal specialist is a surgeon who is trained in orthopedic surgery, neurosurgery, has done a fellowship in spinal surgery, and is board certified in both spinal surgery and in their primary specialty and practices spinal surgery and is able to offer all the options to the patient. And that's one of the great advances in spinal healthcare, which we didn't have until recently in the past two decades. And so this is something which is important to understand. Our next panel is gonna talk about recovery after surgery. And, and this is a really exciting panel because Dr. Roy, one of our spinal champions is on this panel. And actually, this question is why we are doing spine talks. This question is why we have created this entire concept. And it's to help people understand what is going on. And we as physicians many times are ignorant of the questions that patients have, the, the fears they have, the concerns they have. And so by talking to spinal champions and talking to specialists in a way that you can understand, we're hoping that we can alleviate fear, give you that knowledge, and help you overcome your problems. Sabrina. Thank you, Dr. Schuler. As you mentioned, this is a very unique and very exciting panel, so I'm really excited to be introducing these fine people here today. We are going to be discussing knowledge and hope and inspiring stories on the integral part of recovery after surgery, the first two weeks. So I have Tao Allen and Lindsay Oros, both physician assistants at the Virginia Spine Institute, and Dr. Rita Roy and Sheldon Butenhuis, as Dr. Schuler mentioned, are both celebrated as spinal champions, people who have achieved an improved quality of life through neck or back treatment. So please help me welcome everybody. <laughs> Tao, I'd like to start with you. Sure. And I want to talk about what patients should expect given those two weeks after surgery from being discharged to home from the hospital. Sure. You know, surgery creates inflammation throughout the body. Your body didn't know that you signed up for surgery, so inflammation is a normal response. You know, it's, you will have pain and discomfort after surgery, and you need to be prepared on how to address it. Um, while it is possible to be pain-free after surgery, but you have to be prepared. So. There should be a goal of a certain pain level that can be tolerated. For example, using the pain scale, a 4 out of 10 or less with the use of medications could be considered reasonable. If you take too much medication to be completely pain free, well then that may come with unwanted side effects. But allowing your pain to escalate too high before you use medications, well then 
that it may not be as effective. But be mindful, there are other medications besides narcotics that can help with pain. Your provider should give you some alternative options. And remember, you will have days where you struggle, but overall you will see with time your pain will decrease. So then once you understand how to manage your pain, then mobility is important. You know, with advances in surgical technique, the incisions are smaller, the dissection um, and, or is less disruptive to the tissues. Our patients are so surprised how mobile they are after surgery, okay? So, understand your limitations, but walking is an important goal. Walk short distances throughout the day, but listen to your body. Don't push through the pain. This will only set you back and may require more medication. And your provider will guide you on when to start physical therapy. Also, surgery creates not only mental, but physical stress. You burn thousands of calories healing from surgery. You're going to feel tired. You're going to want to sleep more. Um, and just listen to your body. Sleep when you can. And if you need further guidance to get better sleep, ask your provider to help you. There are medicines that can help. And sleep in whatever position you feel comfortable in, uh, as long as it complies with your provider's instructions. Sleep allows your body and your mind to heal. But also, it's normal for you to have some emotional changes that occur after surgery from this type of stress. So it's so <laughs> important to have friend and family support to help you through this. Having a positive mindset is part of a successful recovery. So in conclusion, listen to your body and heal. Your body has the amazing power to heal itself. Set reasonable goals and expectations. Now during these two weeks, set small goals, but eventually, whether it's dancing at your daughter's wedding or playing the sport that you love, and you can achieve this. Thank you, Tao. It sounds like expectations and management, as well as achieving, setting and achieving attainable goals is really key in this Absolutely. recovery process. Mm -hmm. We do have two spinal champions here today, so I'd really love to invite you to share your thoughts on what, how you were able to set those attainable goals and what difference that made for you in your recovery process. Sheldon? Yeah, so uh, Tom mentioned uh, patience, and I think this is probably the most important. So uh, at the time of my accident and, and when I had surgery, I had a, a two-level spinal fusion, L4 through um, S1. Uh, I was a PGA golf professional. Uh, I was an avid triathlete, a marathon runner. Uh, so the idea of uh, not doing anything was a little alarming. And uh, I took the approach, uh, one, making sure that I listened to uh, my doctors and therapists, and two, set small goals. So I had my surgery in November. We had uh, the, the uh, We've Got Your Back 5K coming up in May, and I set a goal of just completing it. Uh, I wasn't gonna run at the pace that I was used to, but I just set the goal of, of, of achieving the finish line. Uh, and this was a big difference, and it allowed me to uh, heal uh, on the right scale, and it allowed me to get back to an active lifestyle. And today, uh, I just completed a year ago an Ironman. Uh, I've run a couple of marathons oh, since my surgery. That's awesome. That's and so, uh, thank you. so I would say, listen to your doctors, uh, listen to your therapists, and take your time. Uh, a marathon is... Uh, it's a slow process, and, and we'll get to the finish line. But uh, yeah, listen to your doctors and, 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 your uh, and therapists. And, <laughs> exactly. And of course, your My PA. wonderful PA. PA. <laughs> Rita, as a businesswoman and a mother, can you share your thoughts on that? Yeah. When I um, came to Virginia Spine Institute and I met Dr. Schuler, and he told me that I needed a spinal fusion, um, I was pretty shocked and scared. And everything he said after that, I didn't hear. I know he was talking to me. Tao was the PA who actually in, operated on me, came in and told me a lot of things, and I nodded my head and said, mm-hmm, yep. And all I could hear is, oh, God, how am I going to get through this? What if something terrible happens? What if I'm 
not able to drive my kids around. What's, how am I going to get through this? Um, and I think that um, that moment is such a difficult moment when you are um, with your healthcare provider and you're getting bad news that, um, that, that you're going to be out for a little bit. Um, and that was sort of the genesis of this whole program, as Dr. Schuler mentioned earlier. I, I really just needed to hear it again. I needed to hear from people. I needed to really understand what was going to happen to me. I needed to understand what that picture looks like, what happens to most people, um, what's most likely to happen to me, um, and understanding that those first two weeks after surgery are probably going to be challenging, but that I'm going to get better, and I'm going to get back to doing everything that I've always enjoyed doing. And I just needed to hear that over and over again um, because I didn't hear it that first day. And, and I needed a place to go to, um, to get information and to understand what I needed to do to get better. I remember being in the exam room in Dr. Schuler's office, um, and he looked at me, this is the only thing I remember, and he pointed his finger at me and said, we're going to do our part, you have to do your part. And I took that really to heart. And um, when I had my surgery and everything went well and I was discharged to go home, I was terrified because I was afraid I was going to break myself. And Tao, who was, who was my wonderful PA, um, said to me, Rita, you are not fragile. You're not going to break. And gave me specific instructions on what to do, which were the things that she just said. Listen to my body, get lots of rest, stay hydrated, and walk, and walk a little bit. And, um, and it was, uh, to me, it was a miracle that nine months later, I walked in the first 5K I had ever done in my life. Uh, I was always afraid. The word 5K was scary to me. It seemed really big. Never done one. And, um, and there I was coming across the finish line at the We've Got Your Back race. Um, so I, I'm thrilled to be on this panel. Uh, I am a grateful patient, and I am passionate about what we're doing today. As you should be. Yes. <laughs> Hearing your stories is truly powerful and inspiring, so thank you very much for sharing. It sounds like you may have had a typical experience in making sure that you are reaching those attainable goals and communicating with your provider. But Lindsay, not everyone will have a typical experience. Can you speak on how you can tell the difference between a normal recovery versus something that you should be contacting your provider and questioning about? Yeah, you know, that's a great, great point. Um, the recovery can be quite a roller coaster, and most of that will be normal. But we need to know when to call our surgical team. You know, make sure you know who's available, when they're available, because things will come up, you'll have questions. So just to highlight some major points, um, fever is something that will occur based on the physiologic stress of surgery. That is typically a low-grade fever, and that can come and go over the first one to two weeks after surgery. However, if it extends beyond that, or if it elevates above 101, and you're using acetaminophen to bring it down, and it's not coming down, and you're feeling sick, you should call your provider and talk through the symptoms and determine if more needs to be done in terms of the symptoms. Uh, the wound is also a big question. What do I do with my wound after a spine surgery? Thankfully, with our minimally invasive techniques, there, aren't, you know, there isn't much to do with your wound after spine surgery. But if it opens up, that's a call to your provider. If there's leakage beyond the first few days that requires multiple bandage changes or leaks through your bed sheets when you're sleeping at night, that's unusual. You should call your doctor and talk through that because um, you know, they may want to see you earlier. Pain is also something that Tal talked quite a bit about and we need to expect it. About a four out of 10 on that pain scale is typical. But if your pain is escalating and you're using your pain medications and it's not helping, that could mean there's a problem. So we need to call our doctor and talk through that. Headache is also something that can occur with the stress of surgery. But if you have a massive headache and you've never had that before, it doesn't matter whether you're sleeping, awake, standing, laying, walking, call your provider. Headache can sometimes mean there's an issue after a spine surgery. 
Constipation is something that all patients battle with using pain medications, so that's a normal part of the recovery. But if you're not having bowel movements and days are going by and you don't know what to do, there are many things that we can do to help stimulate that bowel movement and we need to do it. There can also be other reasons why you're not having that bowel movement and we need to know, know about it. And I think that if you have a great surgical team and you know what to expect, you know when to call them and they'll help you through this difficult time. And once you get beyond the first two weeks, which is the hardest time, things start to level off and that roller coaster gets a little bit smoother and smoother in terms of the recovery. Thank you. As always, communication is key. Mm -hmm. Tao, what would you say the most important thing for patients prior to surgery to understand in order to have successful surgery, excuse me, successful recovery. Oh, sure, and, and, and communication is so important between you and your provider. You really need to understand the purpose of your surgery and how it will address your main symptoms. Your surgery should be designed for you. You really need to empower yourself with the knowledge so you can have a successful recovery. Be patient. Understand that your body needs to take time to heal. While those day-to-day -day advances may seem so minimal to you, surgical recovery just takes time. Thank you. In closing, Lindsay, <laughs> what do you feel is the most important thing when you're speaking to your patients that they acknowledge in recovering after surgery? You know, the truth is that the actual surgery is just the beginning. That's just the very first step. And even this first two weeks that we're talking about is just a blip in the radar. Spine pathology and treatment of your spine is a lifelong process. We need to engage in lifelong fitness, conditioning, and protect our back for the rest of our lives. Even a year after you're done with your recovery and your doctor says, see you in a year, I don't need to see you regularly, everything looks great, you know, you've healed up well. That's not where it ends, that's the beginning. You have to get into a fitness routine and keep with that and think of your back as a problem that's gonna be with you and hopefully you don't hear about that problem, hopefully you don't feel that problem, but it's something that we need to maintain and work on the rest of your lives. Thank you, I think, I want to say thank you for sharing all of your thoughts, Sheldon and Rita as a spinal champion and of course Tao and Lindsay as PAs and shedding light on an important part of that recovery process those first two weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sherman. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that, that was exceptional. And, and, and truly, as we said, this is the basis of, of why we've created this, this mission of, of educating people and reaching out. You know, it's interesting. We as healthcare providers, we understand our, our language. We understand what we're doing but we don't realize the impact of the emotional shock of somebody hearing that they have a problem or that they need surgery or, or that is something that, that they have to change their lifestyle. And I think what Dr. Roy said about her experience of, of blanking out after she heard the diagnosis is the exact reason that we need this venue to help patients. And it's to say, well, stuff was said, I may have understood it, I may not have understood it, but I need to rehear it. And so by creating this, it gives us an incredible opportunity. The other important thing is that we can provide information, especially as we have spinal champions speak, about the truth. And, and, and the reality is, and I hate to say this, but surgeons lie, not intentionally, but they don't really understand the recovery process unless they've gone through it. And most surgeons will say, okay, yeah, you'll have surgery, you'll be over it in a week, two weeks, three months. But in reality, it is a lifetime process, and it takes a year and a half to completely recover from major surgery and be back to a point that you forget you had the surgery. Now, it doesn't mean you're not functioning extremely well during that period, but it takes a long time. And, and I found this out myself because I had my neck surgery, I had two artificial discs and a fusion, and I got to three months out and I was feeling really good and I was talking to one of my friends who I had operated on a few years before and I was telling him about how happy I was. I had recovered, I was better. And he looked at me straight on and he said, wait till you're a year and a half out, you'll feel much better. And I was in shock because I had no idea what he was talking about. And yet he was right. I kept improving even beyond where I was when I was functional. But by a year and a half, I had forgotten I had had the surgery and I was functioning without any restrictions and, and completely normal. So while we may be able to function at a very high level before, 
that improvement is a long process. In reality, most surgeons, the vast majority of surgeons, don't understand that. So by having this venue and Spinal Champions Talk, we can help you understand. And, and that importance that Lindsay brought out of, of a lifetime commitment. In your back, you got 23 discs, you have 50 facet joints, which are the little joints that allow for, for motion. And even though we may fix one, it doesn't mean another one can't go bad. And life is a degenerative process where we can fix one problem, but something else can happen. Now, through the great innovations of artificial discs and regenerative medicine, we minimize the stress, but sometimes fusion surgery is needed or sometimes just the degenerative process causes stiffening, which will impact the adjacent segment. So it's important to understand that we all need to be doing this, and this should be taught in grade schools. Proper biomechanics, proper core strengthening, flexibility, dynamic activities, aerobic conditioning, and just walking isn't enough, and just, just doing one set of exercises isn't enough, but it's varying it. And it's that behavior and proper ergonomics where you position yourself properly, you have a proper workstation, you lift properly, that's how you're gonna prevent problems for a lifetime or at least minimize them. So what a, what a wonderful panel, what a wonderful session. Next, we're gonna to go to a video from Dr. Daniel Gelb who's gonna talk about the importance of posture. The whole concept of posture, you know, is really uh, our ability to understand how posture affects function has blossomed, you know. The, we used to, we used to really con conceive the spine as you look at it, somebody from the front, because that's the way we face people. So you look at an x-ray and you kind of pay a lot of attention to what we call the coronal or the frontal view, and the spine should be straight. What we, when, when people have studied the effects of posture on, on function, what we found was that it's actually the sagittal, the side view that affects how people how, how people's quality of life is affected by their posture. And it really is driven from the ground up and from the top down. It, it, it's kind of the same. On some level, in order to function, in order for people to do what they want to do, you have to be able to see forward, right? You're, 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 you have to have a horizontal gaze, right? And you have to be able to hold your hands in space to manipulate tools. And if you can't do those two things, then you're really very, very disabled. So that's, so the overall goal, the first goal of posture is to get your head above your pelvis, right? You need to stand up straight so that when you stand up, your head is kind of right above your sacrum. Um, and all of spinal alignment is driven by that goal. And when, and when you talk to people who can't stand that way, for whatever reason, they have a fixed spine problem that inhibits them from standing up straight, they'll tell you that their ability to function is completely impaired. And, it's, and when you study it, it's amazing how impaired it is. So you take someone who stands five centimeters forward of their sacrum and can't get any, that's as best as they can do. Right? They will function, if you take some kind of generalized quality of life measurement, some kind of test that you give people in general in the general and say, how are you doing? Someone who has that kind of spinal alignment functions like someone with an amputation functions like someone with decompensated pulmonary disease, like decompensated diabetes. So, I mean, it's incredibly debilitating. If you have someone who stands more than 10 centimeters forward of their sacrum, so they just they lean forward, there is no medical condition that is as debilitating as that in terms of day-to-day -day physical function. It's an incredible function. And, and so what we find, what you find when you study this is that the whole thing starts in, the way, you want your head above your pelvis, but how do you get there? right? You get there by balancing the curves of your spine. So we all have, our spine is made such that our cervical spine has a curve to the front. So we keep our head up. Our thoracic spine has a curve to the back, which deepens the chest cavity. So it increases our pulmonary capacity by making the bellows of our lungs deeper front to back. And then in order to compensate for the thoracic kyphosis, the backward bending, you have to have a forward bend in your low back. And the question is how much, how do you balance, how do those things balance out? And the interesting thing is it all starts from your pelvis. So the pelvis is, is the bottom of your spine. Your sacrum is part of your pelvic ring, is the bottom of your spine. It's where your spine and your hips attach. And again, so the, the goal is to get your head above, above or slightly behind your hip joint. Because when, when a normal person stands, they, everything balances out so that it's very energy efficient. 
right? When the normal person stands, it, it takes about 50 f calories an hour to stand in place. I mean, you burn, people say, well, I stand all day. I, 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 I don't need to diet because I'm up on my feet all day. I'm burning all these calories. But you're not, right? Just because stance is so efficient that you don't really burn very many calories when you stand. Because once you get behind your hips and your body and your weight kind of falls behind your hips, your hip capsules, the joints of your hip, the capsules actually just tighten up. So there's no muscular force involved in keeping that position. But once you're in front of your hip, now all your muscles in the back of your thigh, in the back of your gluteal muscles, in your, in your buttocks, in your back, have to now pull you backwards to keep you from collapsing forward. So now these muscles are firing continuously, and it becomes very, very energy intensive just to stay on your feet. Well, we're excited uh, to have yet another one of the top specialists in the nation from Dr. Gelb contributing this information. And again, that, that's part of what we're doing here at Spine Talks, is we're bringing to you in your home, on your phone, on your computer, the best experts in the nation so that you can understand the options. Whether you live out in the country or you live in a big city, you'll have instantaneous second opinions and, and access to information that very few do. So we're so excited to bring that to you. Our next panel is going to talk about something new and exciting, and it's how to get a better recovery after surgery, an enhanced recovery, but more importantly, this is part of fighting the opioid epidemic. We know that there's an opioid problem in the country, and we want to try to minimize the use of narcotics uh, in the recovery process so that people can have a better recovery, but hopefully not fall down the rabbit hole of, of medication use and abuse. And so with that, I'm going to have Lindsay Oros, one of our PA extraordinaires, lead the panel. Thank you, Dr. Schuller. So this is truly an exciting panel and some really magical stuff I'm gonna talk about on improving pain after surgery with less narcotics. But first I'd like to introduce the panel. We have Dr. Asan Jazimi, he's our spine surgeon and he's editor of the Foundation's Journal. Next to him is Ashley Maliarakis. She is our beloved registered nurse at Reston Hospital and she's also a spine navigator there. Ashley, can you tell us a little bit about what that means? So my role basically is to be really involved after the care. They kind of see my face in the beginning with a little orientation video. I try and reach out about a week before patient's um, surgery and kind of give them a rundown of what to expect while they're in the hospital. This is a super anxious time in their lives, a big, big surgery. Um, so if I could take out just this much of the anxiety of, you know, what does my nurse look like versus a nurse tech? What is a nurse tech? Uh, what are these drains that are going to be on me? Are there going to be drains? Um, just little things about, about how their recovery is kind of going to start, and it starts in the hospital. Um, so I, I come and I see the patients every day. I try my best to be there when the surgeons are rounding or the PAs. Um, and, and basically, we're on a, a touch basis all day long via text or via phone calls on uh, fine-tuning the patient's care. So anything that uh, needs to happen with the patients, any even acute changes, I'm able to report back to them and they can respond immediately, even while they're in clinic. So, And let me tell you, this is crucial. I did not have her there with me this morning yeah. and it took me, well, twice as long to do all of my work. So we appreciate it. So, you know, we've talked a lot about surgical techniques and how there have been great advancements over the past decade in spine. Uh, minimally invasive surgeries, smaller incisions, navigation systems, robotic guidance, uh, 3D printed implants. I mean, you name it, we've got it. Spine is blessed with all these technologies. So it only makes sense that we have rethought the way we recover our patients. And um, traditionally, we were using IV pain medications, um, and, and these can be very strong and have lots of side effects. They did work at controlling pain. They mask pain, they make you sedated, they make you very constipated, sometimes very confused, and even nauseous. So the recoveries were very slow with this uh, pain technique. But if you start to think about the different pathways of pain and, and, and how you treat these pathways, you can use various types of medications instead of narcotics or opioids or painkillers and really control pain in a much better way with less side effects. So what we're doing is when our patients come into the hospital the day of their surgery, we're giving them a cocktail of medications. And this is before they go back to the operating room, they're completely awake. We give them an anti-inflammatory agent, we give them a muscle relaxer, we give them a nerve medicine, a long-acting pain pill, and high-dose acetaminophen. 
Now, some people will say, oh, that doesn't work for me, acetaminophen, that's too mild. But we give it at a high dose, and in the hospital, this is extremely effective. So as they say, don't knock it till you try it. It really does work. <laughs> Um, so the patients take that cocktail, they go back to the operating room, and during surgery, we're working very closely with the anesthesia teams to calculate the maximum dose each patient can get of a numbing agent. And we're injecting that in and around the surgical area so that when you wake up from surgery, you're actually just numb there, and that's better than pain. And that numbness can last for hours. So when we wake up, we have less pain, and we're awake and can swallow pills. Again. We don't need those IV drugs anymore. If you're too sedated and you can't swallow the pills, you get the IV and you're more sedated and it's this vicious cycle. So our patients are waking up in the recovery room, they have better pain control, they're awake, and they get taken to the surgical floor. Actually, if they're awake and alert and their pain's controlled, what can they do when they get to the floor? They can walk. There was this little thing, it was like the best kept secret as to the key to recovery and its mobility. Um, people had underestimated that, I think, for quite some time. We just didn't know, you know, this old wives' tale of rest is everything. So, you know, we were putting the patients in the bed, giving them this lovely button, and they were just out of it. <laughs> they weren't going to the bathroom. They weren't really able to mobilize yet. Um, they, were, they were out of pain. They were, they were recovering, but at a much slower rate. Um, now we're able to get them on their feet just hours after surgery has started. So once we mobilize them faster, they have restoration of their normal functions. Their GI systems wake up faster, their urinary systems, and truthfully, everyone wants to know, when can I go home? The minute you check into the hospital, the first thing you think of is, all right, when can I go home? I need my bed, I hate this hospital bed, and we're getting our patients home faster, and they're recovering better when they get home. Um, and so this is truly exciting, and we're very happy to talk about it. Dr. Gizzini, um, we need to tell the world about this awesome technique. Our patients are recovering fast, but we need to spread the word. How are we doing that? So first of all, we wanted to see how are we doing. We wanted to measure the success of this program. Anecdotally, my experience with this program has been very good with my own patients. But we really need to measure that to understand how we can better tailor this program for each individual patient. As Dr. Schuler mentioned earlier, every patient is different, every surgery is different. So we really, really need to understand what we need to do for each individual patient and really tailor this program. So for the past two years, we have been studying how patients are doing with this program at our center and also other centers that we are collaborating with to really understand how we're doing. Are we really getting patients faster, home faster? Are they really taking less painkillers? How are they doing after surgery or the, over, the past, over the three months when they're recovering? Are they really doing better? And so far, the results have been a resounding yes to all those questions. And in fact, we are presenting these findings at a national meeting in September so we can share this uh, finding with other specialists around the country. And now we're, the next step is to really understand how we can do multi-centered studies so that we can better tailor this program. Uh, you know, the patients are different. Someone has scoliosis is gonna have a much bigger surgery than someone who's only having a one-level procedure. So, we really need to tailor this. I think there's a lot more work to do, uh, but the results are very promising, and I think it's very important by empowering patients around the country through this kind of panel so they have the knowledge to then go and seek more information about this. Yeah, that's, that's the key. We have to tell you what's out there so you know what questions to ask. Um, actually, the hospital is also tracking the data. You're looking very closely at it. Yeah, are you seeing the same results? Uh, it's actually been remarkable. I think we were all blown away simultaneously by... Uh, what is what is changing with these patients? So um, that's also a part of what I do is I track all the patients' functions. So from mobility, when they're mobilizing, if they're mobilizing that very same day or if it's the next day, and for what reasons, um, what kind of pain regimen they're on. Um, it was a big push in the in the beginning to try and you know have this beautiful multimodal pain regimen with all those different oral medications that. Those, that cocktail that we give preoperatively is then continued on the floor. Um, so gradually we just saw the IV medications dissipate. We realized that we don't need those big, heavy knockout narcotics because the patients are waking up in less pain. So they're, they've got control at the front end, so it may, it, you're maintaining that throughout their entire process of, of recovery in the beginning. 
you know, we were told that there was a lot of buzz already about this topic, and I'm getting some clues that we have some questions from audience members. Let's, uh, let's take those questions. Excellent. So the first question, actually, these are from around the nation. These have come in from around the nation. So our first question is from Betsy from Idaho. Hi, Betsy. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, Betsy says, I've been told I need a back surgery to help my leg pain. I'm excited to hear that patients can get up and walk after surgery. How soon do you see patients walking with this recovery process? So, uh, like I said, it's, it's about hours after surgery. Uh, once the patient is taken to the recovery room and they're recovered, they, the PACU nurse, which is the post-anesthesia recovery unit, that nurse brings the patient up, parks the stretcher in front of their assigned room, the physical therapist is awaiting them. So the physical therapist does strength tests, evaluates their cognitive ability, and then deems if they're safe or not, gets them onto the edge of the bed. We wrap a, a gate belt. It's kind of like a belt. It's just kind of a canvas soft material. So we put that around their upper extremity as far away from the incision as possible. We use a walker and we, we slide a hand under each side. So with physical therapy and the floor nurse, we stand the patient up right there, and they do their little walk right into the bed, into the room. Uh, it's, it's honestly a remarkable moment for a lot of family members that are seeing their, their, their family walk for the very first time. Lots of, lots of tears, yeah. Well, I think, I think Betsy's going to be excited to yeah. hear that. Our next question's coming in from George from Montana. George says, I had a spinal fusion a few years ago and had quite a bit of back pain after surgery. I had a pain button while I was in the hospital and find it hard to believe pain can be controlled without it. Can you explain how this works? Sure, so the idea behind the pain control button was that patients can control their pain better if they you gave them the control to do that. The problem with the pain button was that patients would then fall asleep and then wake up in pain. So the idea behind this program is that we can tailor how much pain medications they actually need, and by combining both short-acting, which means more immediate pain control, as well as medication that stays there in a more longer-acting way, patients' pain is actually better controlled for the longer duration of their stay. And they're, they're, they're controlled at a steady rate so that they don't have these highs and lows. And by doing that, we're able to really better control patients' pain and get rid of uh, another source of narcotic that really is not allowing them to really do what they need to do to get back to their lives faster and get out of the hospital sooner. It's true, George. We got this down. Uh, the next question is coming from Jackie. She's local here in Richmond, Virginia. Hey, Jackie. She says, I'm a chronic pain patient already taking a few different types of these medications you're talking about. Do you adjust your recovery techniques for chronic pain patients? So like Dr. Gizzini was saying, we actually have kind of two set tiers for now. Uh, we have one that's for opioid naive, which means you hardly ever take a narcotic, and then opiate tolerant, which means you've been on these medications for years. So even we have a kind of a standard that we go off of, and we dial up or dial down depending on the needs of the patient. Um, so if they're, they're having too much pain or if they're too sedated, we go up, we go down. Um, and that's kind of the beauty of this whole thing is that it's individualized. Each patient has their own regimen so that they have the most supreme pain control. Excellent. Uh, next is Mark from West Virginia, also maybe nearby. Uh, Mark says, with growing concern for the opioid crisis in America, he's on the same page with Dr. Schuler. Um, in addition to knowing a few people who have gotten hooked on pain pills, I'm terrified to take pain medications myself. Are you seeing less addiction after patients are recovering from surgery? Mark, that's a very great question. I, mean, I get this question from patients who are concerned about this all the time in my office. And what we're doing you know, from, from societal aspect, from the government, from hospitals, from surgeons, everyone's trying to tackle this opioid crisis. And programs like the one we're just ta talking about today, as well as by doing surgery more in a minimally invasive fashion, we are able to control patients' pain better get them back to their lives faster, and to really decrease the exposure to these painkillers. The misconception here is that patients' pain are not gonna be controlled. The whole idea behind this is to really better control their pain and really better get patients back to their lives so that the risk of addiction and abuse is, is decreased. So that's a great question.
next one. This next one comes from Kelly from Pennsylvania. Kelly says, I could not wait to get home after my back surgery last year. She probably wanted to get in her own bed, I'm sure. Uh, do you find that your patients are going home faster with these newer techniques? Um, absolutely. Uh, I, that's been my mo that most favorite part of uh, tracking all these trends and data is actually seeing the days kind of dissipate off people's stay in the hospital. Um, another thing that was kind of surprising to us, it's, it's we're checking off those boxes earlier. Now that we're walking the day of surgery, the next day patients' catheters are coming out so they're able to void sooner in the bathroom. Their pain is, they're already on an oral regimen that they can now take at home. And now physical therapy is deeming them already safe because they've already taken six laps in the hallway even by the next morning comes around. So uh, yeah, what was actually a four, five, six day stay is now becoming two and three days long. So on average, we've actually knocked off a day and a half on length of stay. So you can actually enjoy your bed a lot sooner. Get back so to that bed. I'd like to chime in as well. You know, my, from a personal experience, uh, my brother had scoliosis surgery 20 years ago. And it took a month for him to recover. He was in the hospital for a month. Wow. Uh, and for the same type of surgery, you know, patients are leaving three days after surgery. Um, every patient is different, but it's amazing the tremendous leaps that we've made in spine surgery over the past 20 years. Uh, and programs like this, it's not just a technique, it's the technology, but also these other programs, the nurses, the PAs, everyone around the team in the hospital to really get patients uh, in the right direction. Definitely. Yeah. You know, we're, we're dedicated to demonstrating treatments that work. And if you're having a spine surgery and you're not local, ask your team, you know, do you use IV medicines after surgery? Uh, you know, we talk to each other about this enhanced recovery after surgery, and we call it ERAS. Ask them, do you know what ERAS is? And uh, hopefully the answer is yes. Dr. Schuller? Well, that was such a, a critical session to really understand what we can do to fight this opioid epidemic, but more importantly than that, to help people get their lives back, to get them back to, to successful engagement with their families and their communities. When, when you take a look at it, I've, I've been in practice almost 30 years, and the days and weeks that people spent in the hospital with the older surgical techniques, and everybody got a, a, a PCA pump, patient-controlled anesthesia. That's the, the little button that Ashley was talking about. And, and they would press the button and, and get their narcotics and stay drugged up so that they wouldn't feel pain, but then they wouldn't move. And, and with this great advance, people are getting up, they're moving, they're not getting drugged, they're not getting hung over, they're not getting the addictions, they're not abusing the medicine, and we're seeing better recovery. Now, part of this is because of the great advances in surgical techniques with the minimally invasive surgery, which makes this even more effective. But the other part is just a better and smarter way to manage the pain. And this has been something which has been practiced in other health areas, such as cardiac surgery and some of, some of the different general surgical fields. And now it's been adopted by the spinal surgical community. And it really needs to become the standard of care across the country. And it's something that we're happy to be in the lead on in, in doing. Which brings me to a point that we at the Spine Health Foundation are committed to proving what treatments work. And we do that by, by doing the research on the outcomes of different procedures. And that's what Dr. Giazzini was talking about, is that we're collaborating with other centers to prove that ERAS is a great advancement and ERAS is the enhanced recovery after surgery. So we're proving that the ERAS, this pain technique, this mobilization technique gets people better faster. And when we prove that, we can help this become the standard of care. Well, how do we do that? We do that through an online research tool that we at the foundation developed. It took a decade of work, three different gyrations till we finally got to the successful one, over a million dollars spent, but we were able to build this online research tool which allows us to connect the best centers around the country so we can more rapidly produce data, not just on ERAS, the, the pain recovery, but also on what techniques work, whether it's a regenerative medicine or a minimally invasive surgery or a disc replacement or a fusion technique or a microsurgery. We can prove what works. And to that point, as Dr. Roy said earlier, we need your support. And so we need all of you out there to donate and to make it part of your, your commitment to saying we want to help not just ourselves, but we want to help the nation's spine get better. Over 90% of our population suffers from severe neck and back problems. 
about a third of them become chronic problems and they can be disabling. And it's only through this research, this technique, that we are able to overcome that problem. And so it's important that we have your support because without it, we can't do it. And we need to rely on the generosity of grateful patients and people that understand the value of, of truly great medical research. So to that, thank you. The next topic we're gonna go to is on revision surgery. And one of the problems with the more traditional surgeries is it was very disruptive of the ligaments and the bones and led to breakdown at the adjacent segment. One of the great advances we have with modern techniques when performed properly is we minimize that impact on the adjacent level. So we decrease the chance that the adjacent segment's gonna break down. Yet due to many outdated procedures that still get performed in some places, but also older techniques, we see that adjacent segment breakdown as a major problem. And so Dr. Paul Kramer, another one of our experts from the Indiana Spine Group, is gonna to present to us on revision spine surgery. Revision spine surgery. Hi, my name is Dr. Paul Kramer. I'm a spine surgeon with Indiana Spine Group, specializing in complex and revision surgery. We're gonna to talk today about different reasons why the uh, dreaded spine uh, reoperation happens. We call that adjacent segment disease when it refers to, hey, you had a fusion a number of years ago, and unfortunately, now you have herniated disc, or you have creative instability, or you have uh, uh, nerve pinching at a different level of your spine. And this is going to be uh, a video that is, I'm gonna to try to not use too many uh, spine-specific words, but there's a couple of things we can't entirely get around, we'll try to explain all of them. So there's really four theories of why you had an operation in the past that was successful, and, uh, and that was a fusion operation, and now you're looking at the possibility of needing another operation, usually because you have nerve pinching and adjacent level. By the way, that happens about nine to one more commonly above a prior fusion than a below a prior fusion. Uh, there are a couple of risk factors for that, female, older age, mean age greater than 70, uh, long fusions, fusions to the sacrum, uh, or spinal pelvic imbalance. We we'll go through what that means. I don't want to spoil uh, all of the talk. So the, uh, the first theory is the one that I think is, is the most commonly understood, and that is that if one level of your spine is fused, then that level doesn't move anymore. All the other guys got to work harder. So the, uh, the analogy I always use of that is if you've got a five-man rowing team uh, and you throw one guy overboard, then the other four guys got to row harder to keep up with everybody else. And um, as you fuse more and more levels, you're working those other levels harder and harder. And there's a number of biomechanical studies which support that. You can take a uh, cadaveric spine, put it in the spine simulator, and measure the adjacent level stresses, interest of pressure, laminar strain, all kinds of things, and show that, yes, we indeed do have greater stress at levels directly next to where a spine has been fused in the past. That was uh, really the genesis of a lot of uh, mid-2000s uh, research into disc replacement, facet replacement, and motion preservation technologies, a number of which are still on the market and can be very successful in, uh, in very specific circumstances. But unfortunately, still, fusion is a substantial portion of what we do. It works really well, but it does have, uh, have some, uh, some side effects with, adjacent, with creating adjacent level disease. So loss of motion is one of the things that can lead to uh, biomechanical change, and uh, uh, that is one theory of why you can get adjacent segment disease. Concept of uh, progression of underlying disease, meaning if you have heart disease, you're gonna have more than one bad artery. If you have spinal disease, you'll likely have more than one level that's bad in your back. In fact, any good news, uh, if you've got a bad back, you probably have a bad neck as well. Um, the, uh, there are people who have a herniated disc at one level, never have another problem, and have no substantial disc degeneration. There's also people who their uh, uncle and brother and sister and everybody else in the family has had uh, herniated disc or spinal stenosis or a number of other uh, uh, spinal problems. And with those people, the best way to think about it is what we are doing is we are putting a, uh, uh, a band-aid on one individual problem. We are not changing all of your genetics. We are there, if we fuse one level that has uh, met indications for needing a fusion, that doesn't preclude you from any of the other bad problems that can happen in the future. And sometimes it's just progression of the underlying problem. There's a lot of data that would support this as being a substantial uh, generator of adjacent level problems. And uh, the fact that we see uh, an increase in people who have uh, uh, spinal disorders and need neck uh, operations as well um, in uh, the 
spondylolisthesis, degenerative spondylolisthesis tends to have a higher uh, adjacent level rate than, than something like isthmic spondylolisthesis, which is more of an injury. Um, and people with one disc herniation tend to have more disc herniations. If you got congenital stenosis, you tend to uh, uh, need multiple operations. So there's, a, there's definitely a genetic underpinning to these things. So much of that comes down to saying, how can I maintain my, my flexibility, my fitness, use, use my muscles to help me heal, to help me function to prevent injuries? And, and that's an important thing that we have to do. I, I've been the spine surgeon to professional athletes and, and the NFL for, for decades. And at the end of the day, it's funny, you'll see, you'll see somebody come in who's in their 50s, they played NFL football for over uh, 10 years, and their back is pristine and normal. Yet you'll have somebody come in who's been in the NFL for one year and their back is horribly degenerative. And so why is there such a difference? And genetics plays a factor. We can't change our genetics, but we can change how we function. And, and that's what's important. And I think that understanding proper mechanics, how to exercise, how to take care of yourself is critical. But when you're hurting, you have to say, how do I get out of pain? And when I get out of pain, then I'm able to get back to that function and move. Our next panel is an exceptionally talented group of therapists. These therapists are doctors of therapy, experts in manual technique, and they're gonna share with us ideas on how to better improve your recovery, but also to protect your life long-term. Thank you, Dr. Schuler. I'm also very excited to introduce our final panel for this morning. We are actually honored to have Virginia Therapy and Fitness Center join us today by some of the nation's leading physical therapists. And in fact, they've recently been named by Virginia Living Magazine's Best Physical Therapy Group. So congratulations. <laughs> we'll be speaking with Rich Banton, Carrie White, and Paul Ellington. So thank you very much for being with us here today. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to start with Rich. As a physical therapist, what do you think in the continuum of care is the most important for thing for patients to realize? Uh, that physical therapists are movement specialists. And so just like you take your car in for a checkup, you should do the same thing with your body. Um, come see a physical therapist every six months, once a year before you have pain, because uh, it's easier for us to fix things through preventative maintenance um, than until waiting until things break down. What sort of preventative maintenance should be on people's radars? Carrie, would you mind speaking to that? Um, a lot of it is just taking, um, taking care of your body, trying to um, have some sort of exercise regimen. Um, a, st a stretching protocol is good. Um, you know, you're, just like we take vitamins and minerals every day, you, know, you need to take care of your muscles um, and your body in that aspect too. Thank you. Rich, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, only just to kind of reiterate what Dr. Schuler said and Dr. Haynes earlier is that um, it's important to identify what the pain generator is. And physical therapists are a big part of that team in doing so. So you, you can't treat what you don't know. And um, physical therapists are, have excellent skills at what we call differential diagnosis. We can help patients determine what type of tissue is actually involved in their pain, which kind of helps us narrow down the best treatments to, uh, to help them achieve better outcomes. In order to achieve those outcomes, what would you say patients' goals are? What are your goals for your patients? Uh, there's, there's three important goals with, with any patient that goes through physical therapy. Uh, the first one is, is education. So um, the more they understand about their disease or their injury um, or the healing process, the, it kind of curbs the fear that they have entering a rehab or going through surgery. Um, so education is a big part of what we do as physical therapists, and that's, that's certainly probably the most important goal. Uh, secondly, is, um, it's important that we give patients a strategy, kind of empower them to be part of the, the healing process, kind of give them solutions. Uh, patients that are more active in physical therapy uh, compared to passive you know, have better results. And um, thirdly, I mean, we, we create a, an environment for healing to take place. That's, that's what I tell every patient that comes through the door is, you know, our goal is to create an environment for healing to take place. We have a lot of skills and tools available to us to help patients achieve that goal. So I would say education, empower them to be part of the process um, and create an environment for um, healing to take place. Those are main things. 
Paul, can you speak on what you specifically do in order to promote that environment of healing? Yeah, absolutely. So something we'll touch on later is the fact that Carrie and I are both health coaches as well as physical therapists. So a lot of what we look at is the bigger picture. So in our current healthcare system, you have surgeons that will do surgery and physical therapists that can help with the recovery from surgery, dietitians who address your diet, but there's not really someone who addresses that big picture, and that's where health coaches can come in. Um, so the things that I like to do with my patients is identify what they are most lacking in their life. Sometimes it is diet and exercise, but sometimes it's sleep quality, and sometimes it's stress reduction, and all of those things are critical factors in how our body is able to recover. So as Rich was saying, we want to create the most hospitable environment in your body to allow for that recovery. Um, so from a health coaching standpoint, and just an overall wellness standpoint, that's what we like to look at is make sure that we're not neglecting one factor and we look at the patient as an overall human being as opposed to just, are you moving correctly or are you in pain? We want to look at the big picture and make sure we're not neglecting anything. Absolutely. So you're speaking right now to the physical body, mm -hmm. but the mental body, and obviously patients who are suffering through pain or recently coming out of surgery or facing surgery, there's obviously fear involved. Rich, how do you find that patients deal with fear and in coming to you for help? Uh, well, fear's a, a normal thing that any patient should experience, and it's actually expected. And uh, I mean, there's many factors involved in why they have fear um, starting rehab. Um, one might be that, you know, MRIs so compared like in a spine injury to an ankle sprain, you know, MRIs and x-rays are more commonly used with spine injuries compared to ankle sprains and, you know, that's fearful for some patients. Um, they may also have a history where a family member was disabled because of a spine injury and so they fear that they're going to be uh, unable to care for their family and be financially uh, stable. Um, and so that's, that's part of the education, again, for physical therapists is that we kind of help curb, curb those fears. And um, I think another factor with spine injuries is that compared to other injuries in the body is that you, patients can't see their back. So if, if I sprain my thumb, I can look at my thumb, I can move it, I can see that it's not fractured, I can touch it, I can feel that it's not swollen, but patients can't see their backs. And so again, that's kind of the role of a physical therapist is to kind of educate the patient that you know, things can heal and, and most likely will heal within six weeks if you follow the, the right prescription from your doctors and PTs. And PAs. And PAs. <laughs> now, you mentioned not being able to see your back. Obviously, there's image testing, MRI, CT scans, and for someone who hasn't experienced that yet, that may be scary to them. As a physical therapist or a health coach, do you guys help coach your patients through that process? Absolutely, and, and Dr. Schuler mentioned that in life is a degenerative process, and what patients need to know is if, if you took 100 people off the street that didn't have back pain, and they were over 40 years of age, and you did an MRI or an x-ray of their spine, you would see degenerative processes. You would see disc herniations. You would see annular tears. You would see fissures, and these patients don't have pain, so just because you see an image of something in your back that uh, seems scary or sounds scary, it's not necessarily a pain generator. And, and that's another role of a physical therapist is to kind of work with physicians to help understand what actually is causing the pain in that patient. So again, it's that continuum of care that's really important mm -hmm. and, and making sure that you're communicating with your team. Right. Oh. Oh. One, uh, is one thing to that? Yeah, Carrie. And sometimes patients, they have a lot of access to information prior to following up with the physicians and they'll come in with their MRI reports and and stuff to us and they're like look at all these things that are wrong you know and so just adding to what Rich said it's just sort of you know explaining some of those things and what they mean in terms of defining terms and then you know making sure well these are some questions you want to ask when you go in and see the doctor and just I think understanding that and that process could help um, also diminish their fear to what they're heading into as well. You mentioned being prepared to ask questions to your doctor or your provider can you give some examples for patients to think about what questions they should be asking? If they're, you know, if you're considering surgery, obviously there's a lot of questions that they, you know, that they can ask. Um, I think it's the most important thing is just understanding the process, and I think we've done a really good job of that today, in um, starting from the beginning and going to the end. And I think just knowing what the th what the steps are, what the next step, what the next steps are, and knowing what to anticipate, um, will help. Um, just helps people understand the process and makes them feel better about what they're deciding to do because it is a big decision. Absolutely. 
I do feel like we need to rewind a bit. And Paul, you mentioned you and Carrie are health coaches. Can you give a brief description of what exactly a health coach is? Sure. So a health coach is someone that can help you make life-changing differences that are sustainable. Again, in our current medical system, we don't really have someone that's going to address the big picture with patients. So that's what a health coach is trying to do. And you know, whether it's the diet and exercise or the stress levels, we can really try and figure out what is most important to you. Um, so the example I like to use with my patients is, do you just want to be able to take care of your grandkids or do you want to go out and run a marathon? You know, that's obviously going to change the continuum of care and what we're trying to help these patients achieve. Um, so when you sit down and talk with a health coach or a physical therapist, what we're going to do is identify what is most important to you and set goals that are meaningful to you. I like to ask patients, where do you see yourself in six months and where do you see yourself in five years? Because if we can set those smaller goals and start achieving that, you can get the momentum going. And when you start achieving these smaller goals, those small things can lead to really big changes over time. So I think that's more or less what a health coach is involved in. And obviously, with all of us being physical therapists, we tend to specialize more on the musculoskeletal side of things. But we need to make sure we're not neglecting the psychosocial part of things, like you were saying, that mental health aspect. And that's kind of where the health coach comes in versus what we do as physical therapists. Sure, that health coach doesn't specialize in one particular training or one particular area. You are much more broad. Right, so we're trained to look at the big picture, but there's obviously a need for specialists, and we know who to refer to and when it's the appropriate time to refer to a spinal surgeon or a dietitian if it's outside the realm of what a health coach can adequately do. Um, so what we like to do is set those small-term goals, make sure that the wellness component of their life is really being touched on. Thank you. Carrie, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I think, you know, some, not everybody knows, you know, it's a, it's a growing profession, health coaching, it's actually kind of exploding in the wellness industry. Um, so people aren't always familiar with what we do, but I think some people are really well, uh, ready to take on their wellness and make some changes, but a lot of times they're afraid to reach out to people like us because they're afraid that we're going to take away everything that they enjoy in life. And um, that actually couldn't be further from the truth. So, you know, we, it's important to meet people where they are when they're going to be making changes. And um, a, a lot of times, it, you know, it's good to start slow and steady. And it's not necessarily about taking things out of your life as it is adding things into your life uh, that, that are going to augment your life and help, and, and, and help you feel better in the long run. Um, you know, it can be as simple. Some people come in and they are very self-aware and they can be like, you know, I know, I understand that dairy upsets my stomach and I'm ready to take it out of my diet. Can you help me? But other people don't know where to start and they just want to come in and know that they need to work on their health. So we can meet them where they are and it's about, um, it's, you know, setting, helping them set, set goals. It's very individual um, and it is very self-guided as well. So you can start and go gangbusters, or you can just start off simply, you know what, let's go home and have you cook from, you know, in your own kitchen twice in the next two weeks and see how that goes. A lot of times when people start to make small changes and, then they, and they feel better, then they're really ready to, to get going. It sounds like so just similar to the recovery after surgery panel, setting those small attainable goals <coughs> is really key here in that, that commitment to wellness. Absolutely. Rich, you know, you, you have recently developed a wellness program at Virginia Therapy and Fitness Center. Why did you decide to do that now? Because we felt there was a gap between patients that were being discharged from physical therapy and uh, moving on to their personal trainer. So um, a lot of times insurances only allow physical patients to go to physical therapy for about six weeks to 12 weeks, and they clearly need more time to heal. So the, the wellness program is a, a great adjunct to take them into you know, their return to sport or, you know, help them get back into the gym where they can work with their personal trainer. Um, so that was the primary reason. And as Paul and Carrie alluded to, you know, just looking at the big picture of, of wellness is you know, something that in the past, I've been a physical therapist for 25 years, and that, that, didn't, that piece did not exist in the past. Yeah, feeling that niche and that continuum yeah. of care. Thank you for, Thank for you. having that foresight. This question is to both health coaches, Carrie and Paul. When someone is ready to address their health and wellness concerns, I think you may have highlighted on this before, but is it really something that has to be done all at once? Um, 
Yeah, I um, I sort of touched on that before, but it, it does not. You know, I said every everybody has a different pace. Um, everybody has different things that they're willing to do and to to achieve their health and wellness. And and it just you know begins with starting where the patient is and and just going through their health history and discussing their goals. And like Paul said, you know, where do you want to be six months from now and a year from now? And then and then start. You know, some people. Are ready to start really quickly, and other people are, you know, are not. And it's, it's just, um, you know, it's taking what you are ready to do and going from there. Yeah. So I think it goes back to taking those patients from where they are and making sure that we're setting goals that are meaningful to them. If they just want to be able to play with their grandchild without pain, then maybe our goal is two weeks from now you'll be able to get up and down from the floor without pain. Whereas some people are going to come in and say, I want to completely redo my diet. Um, and if that's the case, then you know they're clearly a little bit more ready to start, and we might set some higher end goals and higher level goals. But that doesn't mean that we can't meet with somebody and set the one goal to say, "Cook in your kitchen." You know, you eat out seven days a week. Why don't you try eating out six days a week? And that's a small achievable goal. You don't need to go from eating out every day to cooking at home every day because realistically, that's a burden, and not many people are going to be ready to make such a life changing difference overnight. So. I think Carrie hit it on the head with meet the patient where they are, and if they're ready to make small steps, then we'll allow them to do that. But if they're ready to run, well, let's run with them. Absolutely. Thank you. We actually have some questions from the audience. Uh, actually, these are people tuning in. This is Chris from Maine. And he's asking if you can comment on the hazards of the internet self-diagnosis. <laughs> Who wants to take a stab at that? I'll, I'll take that Paul, one. Oh, all right. Um, so as I like to refer to the internet self-diagnosis as Dr. Google. Um, so when you Google something, why does my back hurt? Chances are you're going to find some page on WebMD and cancer is always going to be on there because everyone is going to have cancer via WebMD. But what I like to tell my patients is when you see that MRI report and it has all these big medical terms, a lot of our patients come in and they want to know what it is. Um, so I think Rich had already talked about the education factor of our jobs, and that's where we come in, both as physical therapists and health coaches, is to educate our patient and say, you know what, if you're over 40 years old, there's a chance that we're going to find a, a disc herniation on an MRI, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're pain generator. Um, but a lot of patients come in and they're scared, and that goes back into the fear, which we've already talked on as well, is sometimes we just need to be a voice of reason for our patients and make sure that they fully understand what's going on within their own body to try and talk them off the ledge and make sure that they understand that not everything on an MRI finding is crucial to what is causing them their discomfort. Thank you. Rich, I think this next question may be for you. Okay. Uh, you know, when you're hiring physical therapists into your practice, and from a patient point of view, and this is specifically coming from Sue from Massachusetts, what makes a great therapist? What makes great therapy? The more tools you have in your toolbox, the more capable you are of treating patients. So some patients need exercise. So a good physical therapist is trained in how to stabilize and train core muscles to make muscles stronger to help stabilize your spine. Uh, some patients need dry needling, um, which is a technique we use to release tension in muscles. And so physical therapists have to be trained in, in how to use dry needling or other soft tissue uh, techniques to release tension in muscles. And then some patients need uh, mobilization or manipulation, and physical therapists are trained in how to mobilize and manipulate joints. So, you know, the, the more tools that you have available to you, the, the more success you're going to have and better outcomes you're going to have with your patients. So that's, that's something we look for, is uh, are they, have they been enrolled in manual therapy curriculums? Have they been recognized by their, their peers as orthopedic certified specialists? And uh, those are things that we've been fortunate to find through the, the last 20 years. And that's what patients should be looking for as well. Right, absolutely. Well, Carrie, you are very experienced, but you also have a personal story to share, if you wouldn't mind, your journey to wellness uh, and how that relates to, to the audience and share what type of lessons you learned along the way. Sure. Uh, about five years ago, yeah, I, was, I had Lyme's disease and it was uh, really stressful. Um, I had a four-month-old, uh, excuse me, a four-year-old who was having asthma attacks, and I had an 18-month-old who was dealing with food allergies, and then I had Lyme. Um, I had to stop working because I was in so much pain, um, and it was it was very stressful. But 
I was able through some great practitioners in integrative medicine, I was able to heal. But I feel like a lot of the lessons I learned along the way that, basic, that definitely um, prompted me to become a health coach because I feel like they can, uh, they can go across to anybody who's healing from any type of medical condition and especially what we're talking about here today to spinal surgery. Um, the number one thing I feel like that I learned about was um, managing your stress. So I was under a really, really stressful situ you know, situation. And managing, you know, stress can be toxic and really important to, be, to have the tools to manage that when you're, when you're trying to heal and be able to give your body the, uh, the best healing environment. So we, as health coaches, we definitely work with people to give them the tools to learn how to manage their stress. Second is nutrition, obviously. How we fuel our bodies is, is how our bodies are, definitely affect how our bodies are going to heal. So talking to people about the right foods to eat, especially when you're talking to pe people who are going through surgery, um, you know, we try and introduce more an anti-inflammatory foods and get them to work on their diet, preferably before surgery, but a lot of times um, is part of the journey after surgery and the total healing uh, uh, process. And lastly is... Um, going to be um, sleeping patterns? Sleep, <laughs> sleep patterns, yes. Um, when people are heading into surgery, I've had pain for a really long time, as a lot of our patients do, we're taking a lot of pain medications. They uh, come into surgery very sleep deprived, um, potentially, and so after they've gone through the process and they're in the post-surgical phase of healing, a lot of times those processes will return naturally, but not always. And so a lot of people need some tools to help them get through um, or be able to restore um, proper sleep patterns so they can continue on their, their healing journey. So those are probably the, you know, the most important lessons that I learned, and we, like, as health coaches, um, those are important things that we share with them. Thank you for sharing your personal mm -hmm. experience. It's really inspiring to see you put your passion into action, so thank you. And in closing, we've talked about what a health coach does, the importance of good quality physical therapists, but where do you find a health coach? Paul? So right now it's a little bit harder because it is a, a newer field. Um, it's a lot in the wellness industry, so there's a lot of people on social media that are promoting that wellness component. But right now um, you can go online and you can search for a health coach. There's a lot of different organizations that teach health coaches and certify them, so you can go through the agencies to be able to find them. But you can also just go online and search for a health coach in your area. Um, the biggest thing to look for is obviously that they are in fact certified and have taken some form of formal training in that before going and scheduling an appointment. Wonderful. Unless there are any other questions, I think I will be passing it on to Dr. Schuler. Thank you very much, panelists. Absolutely. Well, we owe a debt of gratitude to this team, and I, I especially, since many of them have treated me and kept me functioning and, and helped me get back to my life. And it, it's so important to understand that, that surgery, regenerative medicine, the non-operative care done by physicians is just the tip of the iceberg. And it's really that ability to get back to full function, which gives us our lives back, that doesn't happen without great therapy. And, and ultimately, what you've heard here is an introduction into the concept of great therapy. But it's about therapists who truly understand the problems and then have the resources and time available to be able to treat it. And that's what makes great therapy. It can't be a cookie cutter, just like surgery can't be a cookie cutter. And you can't have one size fits all. It has to be individualized. And great manual therapists who are able to practice in a system where they can use their knowledge and their skills will get one great success. And that's an important part as you're looking for therapy out there, you're looking for great therapy, you need to identify who are the experts, but who have the system resources available to be able to individualize the treatment to help you overcome your problem. So with that panel, thank you very much. Well, we're gonna try to wrap up here. Uh, it's, it's been a lot of information today and, and for our inaugural launch of this web address, We'd like to call back our physician panel to see what information we can answer that's been left out and to try to help you understand in your language how to overcome your spine problems. And, and to that point, we had one question come in. This is from Greg in Southern Virginia. His question was, what is the future of regenerative stem cell treatment going to head over the next 10 to 30 years? 
And the answer is we don't know because it's so early. But I expect that this whole field of regenerative medicine, of osteobiologics, is going to transcend how healthcare is practiced today and treatments that are needed. We're coming out of the century of the computer and we're heading into the century of medical innovation. And it's going to be through, through genomic studies, through recombinant DNA work, the use of artificial intelligence. We're going to wipe out many diseases that existed before. Alzheimer's will be changed, diabetes will be changed, spinal diseases will be changed. And, and that, I think, is the, is the excitement, is to understand how we use our own biology as we DNA analyze the different tissues and come up with the right treatment so we can solve problems. Who knows, degenerative disc disease may become a thing of the past as we find ways to, to treat those discs as they degenerate and find ways to prevent them from worsening. But I'm excited because the next century is going to change the way we live, suffer, and play. And it's going to be because of the great advances in medicine. And medicine will be the great advance of this next century. And so we're so excited that the regenerative medicine is here at its infancy. And using your own biology does work for many people and helps us avoid or delay the need for a major surgical intervention. But in the future, I think it's going to be transforming. So I'm really excited about what we have, but it's the beginning, so we don't know the answer to that yet. With that, we have our, our panel of physicians, and what I'm going to do um, is give everybody a chance just to talk about an area that they're extremely interested in. Um, I don't have a specific question for anybody, but we've covered so many topics, and what I'd like to do is give people a chance just to, to discuss about something that they're passionate about. And ultimately, that's what drives us is our passion, our passion to help people. And so with that, we're going to start with our non-operative arm, Dr. Barrara. Well, we don't need that, actually. Thank you. Sorry. <clears throat> so <clears throat> so I, I do a tremendous amount of regenerative medicine, and we've spent a lot of time discussing the different regenerative medicine options. And Dr. Schuler just talked about how regenerative medicine is going to change the way we approach spinal health care as well as the way we approach orthopedic health care. Um, the, the what we've seen over the last several years is a, a complete revolution of regenerative medicine and the, the different types of treatments we can actually do. With the, initially, it was just a, a, a way of, of stimulating growth and, re, and re-stimulating the healing process. Now we're able to actually put in place and deploy cells that can actually potentially regenerate into healthy tissue. And I, I see this as a completely, I see this as, as, as a treatment that's in its, it's very naive and very young, but what we have in the next five years will be completely different than what we have now. So a lot of what we've talked about today, both from a surgical and non-surgical treatment, is really getting the best results for patients with the least amount of pain getting to that point. So what really excites me and gets me you know, very, what I'm very passionate about is minimally invasive spine surgery. So that's a very broad term, and essentially all that means is getting the same, if not better, surgical results than we used to, but by doing it, by cutting less muscle, getting faster recovery, and having an overall easier surgical uh, recovery. So there are many types of minimally invasive spine surgery, from scoliosis corrections to what I like to coin as ultra minimally invasive spine surgery, and that's with an endoscopic spine surgery. So currently, we're using an endoscope, which is a tiny little camera, much like people getting knee scopes or shoulder scopes, you can actually get a spine scope as well. And by doing that, you can oftentimes remove herniated discs, taking care of the pressure, and really cause almost no pain. It's very, very gratifying when I do these surgeries on patients, and they see me back right after surgery and say, you know, I don't even know where you put your skin incision because it's so small. I have no pain in my leg anymore and no back pain. So that's one of the major advancements that really gets me excited, and I think is a tremendous uh, ability to continue to grow as time goes on. You know, one area that I'm really excited about is really how do we correct patient's spine and their spinal balance in a way that they can lead a better life. They can walk to their car, they can walk their dog, uh, they can go to school. Uh, this is an area where it's been very challenging for us in order to really do the least minimally invasive procedure without harming the patient and 
by, by, by allowing them to get back to their lives faster. You know, scoliosis is an example where there's an S-shaped, S-shaped curve, but it's more than that. It's patients leaning forward and putting a lot of strain on their backs. So Dr. Good is, is a leading expert on this as well. And what we're trying to do is figure out how do we do this with a more minimally invasive fashion? How do we do it with better technology? And how do we align patients' expectations so that they do better, they do have better outcomes like Dr. Glassman talked about. And by empowering patients with that knowledge beforehand, I think we can get better results and we're, we're seeing that. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I think to me and the whole uh, purpose of the spine talks is really um, education. Uh, you know, whether we're talking, whatever type of treatment someone needs, uh, I always tell people, you know, the most common mistake that I see patients and doctors make is choosing or recommending uh, the treatment that you wish you could have or what you want to go through rather than actually what you need. Uh, and it's really important to understand what is the structural problem, what's causing the pain, and, and then you have to pick the treatment that lines up with that. And so, uh, for example, an endoscopic uh, discectomy, a very minimally invasive procedure, is perfect for some patients, but it's actually not the right treatment for other problems. And, and getting doctors and patients educated and helping us to make the right kind of decision. Because if, if somebody is going to have an injection, put their time through a lot of therapy, have a surgery, you want to make sure not only that it's the smallest or the simplest, but the one that has the highest chance of working and lasting for them. And so that's, that's really the motivation of us, of, of us being here and the future of Spine Talks is to really give patients uh, a tremendous amount of information to understand their condition and why one treatment makes sense and maybe another doesn't. And we all know too many people who have had some treatment and then it didn't work or it didn't last for them and then another treatment. And, and one of my passions is really trying to help uh, people to make the best choices uh, to get the result that they want and, and have it last as long as possible. While this is a surgeon heavy panel, I want you to understand these are spinal specialists. These are doctors that truly practice the non-operative care, the diagnostic care, as well as the surgical care. And remember that a, a, a great spinal specialist operates less than 10% of the time on patients, that they're able to help people get their lives back, focus on, on their diagnosis, and manage them long term. There are many patients that I've been taking care of for, for 20 plus years. And, and it's something that we have to focus on saying that this is a, a lifetime commitment to helping people. Now, it doesn't mean they need treatment all the time, but they may go 15 years without a problem and then something else flares up and they have to get it addressed. So these doctors are experts in handling patients' problems. And surgery is just a tool or an injection is just a tool and it's saying, what do we need to do best? And it's that collaboration, that interdisciplinary work with the therapists, with the physician assistants, with the coaches, with the doctors, the surgeons, the non-operative team, the, the physiatrists, the pain management doctors, to say, how do we optimally treat this person without getting them addicted to narcotics and get them back to their lives? And, that, and that's what we're about. That's what we want to educate you, the population, about and, and use this venue to do it. With that, thank you, gentlemen. Rita, if I can call you up. Today, today has been a wonderful day, and, I, and I'm, I'm so excited that we've been able to share all this knowledge with you, and we look forward to continuing to do this for years to come. Uh, what we'd like to do right now is, is to make sure that you understand that SpineTalks.org, that SpineHealth.org is your resource to get the answers to your questions and for those of your loved ones. And we want to be here for you. Dr. Roy. Thank you, Dr. Schuler. Um, I'd like to thank our live audience for being here with us this morning. Um, and I'd also like to thank you watching us from home or from your office remotely, wherever you are in the country or on the world. We are committed to providing information that gives you the knowledge you need to take care of your back and get better. We are committed to doing the research that proves what works. So when you are faced with having to make the decision, should I have surgery or not, you have a reliable, unbiased place to go to get the information that you need. We invite you to join our community 
come to spinehealth.org. You can see our research, you can see our communities, you can see our education, and you can help us spread the good news that there are treatments that work and that you can get back to your life. Thank you for tuning in today. We'll see you online. Thank you.